it's great to be here. Um, it's been several years since I've spoken to this group and not in this room. Um, and then it was to talk about our response to uh, the flood of 2008 and our efforts to recover. And then I talked about adversity and hope. And surprisingly, today I will also talk about adversity and hope and what it means to our children and to all of us in the community. So I chose as my theme for today, building ladders to success, because internally we talk a lot about, you know, are we, are we in fact carrying people along or are we providing them with opportunities under their own energy to achieve success. And ladders seem to be an important and a useful um, image for us as we talked about that. And some of you might ask, are you here because it's buy four, get one free when Dave does the education programming? Um, but United Way does have a voice around education more than ever before. Um, most of you probably know us as a fundraiser, especially in the fall, and you see us coming, you know exactly what we're up to. Um, but United Way has been committed for almost 100 years to improving the well-being of our community. And well-being, one of the key pillars, is education. And what we know from our experience over the last almost 100 years, but particularly our learning in the last 10, is that our current strategies aren't sufficient. We have put millions of dollars into services along with our partners to help children succeed. I will figure this out, by the way. Probably just as I'm finishing, I will not make that sound anymore. So how do we help kids succeed? Because we are not changing the trends in our community. And we're working, all of us are working hard. United Way serves people living in six counties, over 100,000 people, and works with more than 40 different community partners. It doesn't get much better than that. Um, people are willing to work together and try hard, but we're not making the progress that we believe in for kids. And so what else do we need to do differently? And let's be clear, too, that what we're talking about for kids, whether I'm talking about it, or Dave's talking about it, or anyone else in the education field is, that our children have the ability to be successful in school, in work and life. They can make a living wage. They can have the choices that they want. They can support their families. So everything we're talking about today is focused on that. And there's vast agreement on the rungs in the ladder. So all of us need essentially the same steps or phases in our progress towards that success. The first one is early language and literacy. Do we have the skills we need when we get to kindergarten to start out and succeed in that environment? By the time we get to third or fourth grade, do we make a transition from learning to read to reading to learn? It's a key transition for our kids, and it's why you hear us talk about fourth grade reading proficiency all the time. And then by the time we get to middle school, do we have some expectation, some belief about ourselves that we're going to go beyond high school, that we're going to pursue some post-secondary education? While we're in high school, do we advance in math and in science? Are we on track? Are we getting ready for college? And along the way, are we engaged in the community and in our school? Is there more to us than just one dimension? If we achieve most of these rungs, it is very likely that we will succeed in post-secondary education and finding our way to a good job and a healthy life. So part of United Way's journey over the last few years, as we have evolved our sense of ourselves beyond being a funder to being a solution seeker, is that we needed to learn, first of all, how are kids doing? So I'm going to share with you a couple statistics today. Not that we're going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to set the context for what it is that we need to work on together as a community. Remember that first rung in the ladder was early language and literacy. And what's important for us in choosing effective solutions is to be clear about who has the most to gain, 
who's struggling the most, who hurts the most, who's furthest away from the goal. And so in all of these cases, I'll be talking about low-income children, typically children who live in families that make less than two times the federal poverty guideline. That's our target population. So research shows us that low-income kids often enter kindergarten with having heard 30 million fewer words. That's the vast difference in the amount of language and conversation and interaction in the households. It is a huge gap. Also we know, and this is a Cedar Rapids statistic, um, largely because we have most access to data about Cedar Rapids, but 47% of our low-income children, so almost one in two, aren't proficient in reading at fourth grade. This is last year's results. So if I had two children standing up here with me, one would be not likely to be reading at grade level. Also for Iowa, we um, have um, the challenge of ranking 50th in the nation for the graduation rate for black boys. This is a Schott Foundation study based on data from 2010. Um, contrast this with a Gazette headline from February of 2013, which announced that Iowa has one of the leading graduation rates in the nation. So we do have great results for some, but not for all. And then when we think about the living conditions of our youngest residents in our area, a recent point in time study told us that 50% of the homeless in the Cedar Rapids area are children under the age of 18. This also mirrors the statistics from the um, 2010-2011 school year where Cedar Rapids School District had seen the number of free and reduced price lunch eligible children grow to 50%. So food and shelter are important basic needs for our children to establish stability and reliability and safety. And we have a lot of vulnerable children in that area. And so we all know this statement is nothing new to anyone. We all know that what happens to us when we're young has a tremendous impact on who we become as we grow older. And I'm going to talk about two very important aspects of that. One, adversity, and the second is hope. And this is part of our learning as well. So we know what's not going well for our children. Now we need to understand how do we make it go better for our children? And what are the aspects we need to pay attention to? So we learned about a landmark study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. The results were published in the late 90s. And what it determined was that for all of us, irrespective of income, ethnicity, geography, it didn't matter that if we experienced certain traumas, that it had lifelong impacts on our health outcomes, risk behaviors, and our ability to succeed, particularly in school and work. So here are the 10 common traumas. None of these will surprise you. Abuse, neglect, and dysfunction. And key here is that this is not a, typically a one-time experience, but a repetitive experience that results in feelings of powerlessness, um, constant state of alert, children who are never safe. Okay? And the other thing I would say to you is that while we often tend to lock on to childhood abuse, that in fact childhood neglect, so the failure to provide care, emotional or physical, and substance abuse and mental illness in our community actually are some of the most compelling statistics we've seen. And one of the doctors who did the research behind this study said that he believes from a public health perspective that mental illness and substance abuse are the public health academic epidemics of our time, leading to truly negative outcomes for children. So this study was a 10-year study, a partnership between the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente.
And so what happens if children have more than one of these? And the other thing I would say to you is that in this study they determined that um, more than 30% of people had at least one adverse childhood experience. And when you look at the list, particularly with the incidence rate of separation and divorce, it's something we would all say, yes, that happens to lots of us. Okay. So what happens when children have exposure to four or more adverse childhood experiences? And they are most likely to come in multiples. Most people do not experience just one. You can see the increased risk for these um, factors that influence early death, chronic disease, um, poor everyday functioning, depression. Um, some examples, just to set it in a different context, if you had zero experiences of adverse childhood events, you would have a 1 in 69 chance of experiencing alcoholism or being an alcoholic. If you've had three or more adverse childhood experiences, that likelihood increases to one in nine. So why do we pay attention to this? Okay, so for everyone who is a physician or a scientist, I'm just going to apologize right now. I am not going to tell you what parts of the brain we're looking at. <laughs> You're welcome, whoever said thank you. Um, so look on the left is a healthy brain. Look on the right. That is the brain of someone who's experienced numerous traumas. All you need to know is the parts that are circled. These brains are different. Our experience to repetitive toxic stress changes the way our brains are wired and how we function. And why I bring this up related to kids is simply this. Now I have to put my glasses on. Simply this. All along our children's development, they will show us the evidence of the traumas they've experienced. In early childhood, a child with this kind of brain development going on becomes emotionally reactive. They have poor regulation of behavior. Who has heard about children being expelled from preschool? Okay, my husband raised his hand because he hears me talk all the time. But it happens, okay? Difficulty with verbal and spatial memory. As children move on to middle childhood, here's how they express, how their brains express this experience of trauma. Language delay, diminished math capacity, diminished integration and coordination, and difficulty with social cues. Now, one of the reasons I tell you this story is we have an AmeriCorps program that works in schools in Cedar Rapids, and we asked our AmeriCorps members one day, do you see children demonstrating these symptoms of ACEs around you? And their answer was every day, all the time. These symptoms express themselves in a child's inability to function in school. And so we can talk a lot about teachers and curriculum, but teachers and curriculum don't change the impact of adversity on the brain of a developing child. And so by the time kids get to adolescence, here's what we see, though I will tell you I'm the mother of a 12-year-old, I don't think he's had any ACEs, and I think he demonstrates some of these behaviors. <laughs> Poor executive function, impulsiveness, diminished abstract reasoning, yes, that one particularly. No hope for the future and limiting field of vision. So these, these experiences have profound impacts. Washington State, that's been work and they've been working on these issues for more than 10 years, did a study of school children and discovered that in the average classroom of 30 kids, 10 of those children would have four or more ACEs. So 30% of that classroom would be impacted. And their research shows that ACEs are the greatest single predictor for health, attendance, and behavior and the second strongest predictor for academic failure after um, special education. So now I've totally depressed you. Now we're gonna head in the opposite direction. And the reason I'm talking about this too is because the role of United Way is not to be in the shoes of educators. Talking about curriculum and teachers and length of school day, 
our relationships and our position in the community are best suited to talk about that social emotional ground that those children are growing in the social emotional ground that those ladders are standing on if that ground is uneven or muddy those ladders won't stand up so what is it that those children need in addition to quality learning experiences that will help them succeed so the next thing we learned about is hope and we're not as far along here as we are in our understanding of adversity, but if you want to learn more about this, Google the Gallup student poll. Gallup has been uh, doing some research, begun uh, about four years ago, five years ago, on hope, well-being, and engagement, and how it impacts outcomes for children, and what they found, and I won't spend a lot of time on this today, but here's the compelling information that we discovered that we think matters to us as a community and particularly for the, the agencies that United Way partners with. That hope, which is the ideas and the energy we have for the future, drives attendance, credits earned, and GPA. And that hope predicts GPA, redemption in college, and the scores, the hope scores on the Gallup student poll are more predictive of college success than our high school GPA, SAT, and ACT. So we need to be balanced as a community and our strategies to help kids succeed. It means that if we're gonna put the rungs back in the ladder, it's not just about um, teachers and curriculum and time in school. It's about relationships and human capital and those things that happen inside of us, our ability to imagine something different about our future. So how do we make sure that our kids and families have the skills and resilience they need to be successful in the future? I'm gonna talk briefly about some projects that United Way has launched in partnership with other agencies in the community. First of all, I just like this picture. So if I depressed you earlier, I think I'd get brownie points for the cute girl laughing. But the whole point of Read Ahead, Read Every Day, is little ones beginning at birth get books. Their parents come in to the WIC clinic, they pick up benefits, they spend 10 minutes with a wonderful literacy coach who encourages the parents and they get new things to read and new activities. And also these children are assessed at six month intervals. And our early successes with hundreds of children have shown us that 90% of these children, after the first year of the project, are on track developmentally. And when we find children that aren't on track, we're able to refer them to appropriate community resources. And there are more stories, but I don't have that much time because my husband is holding up you know, his fingers. So one of the next strategies, so we're trying to take a lifespan approach. So beginning at birth, filling a really, um, big hole in our service array, we do uh, Read Ahead. Then we move on to supporting children in early elementary and then on into middle school. So in Grantwood Elementary and McKinley last year, we launched a program with AmeriCorps providing tutoring and STEM activities for children. And the good news there is they were able to support over 300 children with over 2,000 hours of tutoring and more than half of the children that received this support were able to achieve grade level or better performance by the end of the year. And they were under um, grade level at the beginning of the year. And then I don't have a slide for this one, but many of you have probably heard about the K-PACE program at Kirkwood Community College, Career Pathways. So we continue on with our investments in supportive strategies helping families, low educational, low, um, low income, low educational attainment parents achieve skills and credentials to increase their income as they continue their journey in life. So there's a lot we can do together. And a lot of what I've told you about today is about statistics. The stories I haven't told you are about the human element that are part of the answer here. With Red Ahead, one of the key stories is of a 17-year-old dad with a five-day-old baby girl 
who came into the WIC clinic for their very first visit and Diana sat with them and talked to them about reading and making eye contact and engaging with their little one. And the dad said to Diana, but I didn't even know she could hear me. So sometimes what we're changing is not anything more than a lack of knowledge. And when we encourage parents to find their own strengths, that is a lifelong gift, and we're beginning that. And with Youth Achievement Corps, I sat in a meeting with staff from Grantwood Elementary the other day, and more than the stories of children being at grade level at the end of the year, I heard stories about Mr. Edwards holding the hand of a little girl every day walking around the track during recess and about a little tiny girl kindergartner walking with big tall Mr. Edwards telling her story in the hallway. Those are the encouraging elements in all of the projects that we have launched. It is about people and relationships and networks of support. It is about that intangible element of belief. Sometimes we need someone in our lives who sees the possibility and can hold it for us before we can. Those are the kinds of projects that we're engaged in in the community. And we invite all of you to think about your role in doing that because all those terrible statistics I shared with you about adverse childhood experiences, the research tells us that there is one consistent mitigating element and I bet you can guess what it is. What is the one thing a child needs to overcome adversity? Somebody shout at me. One human being who can see in them a different future and provide them a safe haven. So when we ask ourselves what we can do to change the future for our kids, the first thing I would encourage us all to think about is how do we start early at birth and wrap our arms around families, not diagnosing them as full of shortcomings and failing, but on revealing to them their own ability to be successful. How might each of us be a caring adult in the life of a child? Big brothers, big sisters, children of promise, there are a number of fabulous mentoring programs in our community. And how do we create compassionate environments? Because adverse experiences happen to all of us. We all live through the disaster of the flood. It was a trauma. So how do we create environments that recognize that and assure people that there is a different possibility? And how do we build hope, particularly for our children? That is the key to a different future. I leave it to Dr. Benson and all of the fine educators in Eastern Iowa to bring us excellent curriculum, but the rest of us are responsible for creating the ground in which our children grow, and that has to be hopeful ground. So I've just had a few minutes to share a little bit about the way we're working right now. I don't know if you have any questions, because I could have told you tons of stuff, 